Now to our guest speaker. I first met Boris Johnson shortly after he became editor of The Spectator. He arrived at the restaurant where we were to have lunch on his bicycle, which he chained loosely outside, or well, very loosely in fact, because uh, he'd lost the key to the padlock and therefore draped a chain rather artistically around a railing, um, not convincingly, but artistically, and uh, hope for the best. I admired his chutzpah, if not his bicycle clips, and of course the bike survived, as indeed has Boris. He has in fact thrived since then, overcoming, overcoming the handicaps of an Eton education, membership of the Bullingdon Club, and presidency of the Oxford Union, to move from journalism into conservative politics as MP for Henley, and there his public profile swiftly made him one of the most popular figures in politics, an area where the word popular has almost vanished from the lexicon. Prior to this, he worked at The Times, The Daily Telegraph, and The Spectator, following in the distant journalistic footsteps, I hope I'm right of this, of a great-grandfather, Ali Kamal Bey, a liberal Turkish journalist. And he is, of course, he does, of course, have a direct connection with the award we have just presented to Jeremy Bowen, uh, in that he is uh, the late Charles Wheeler's um, son-in-law, was. But that, uh, at that first meeting, I suspected that journalism might not be a large enough canvas for Boris, and so it proved when he plunged into politics to become Shadow Minister for the Arts, and then when David Cameron became party leader, Shadow Minister for Higher Education. Selected as a Conservative candidate for the 2008 London Merity election, he defeated the incumbent Ken Livingstone while receiving, in vote terms, the largest personal mandate of any politician in British history. And despite the rough and tumble of political life and the hiccups that accompany any job the size of the majority of a great city such as this, his popularity appears to be undented. Some years ago, he was quoted as saying, I have as much chance of becoming prime minister as of being decapitated by a frisbee or of finding Elvis. Now, I don't know if he's revived this opinion, but the odds against such a development are much shorter than Elvis turning up at City Hall. I'm delighted to welcome the mayor here this evening to talk broadly, I'm sure, on his chosen subject, Who Runs Britain? And in case anybody's wondering, yes, he did come on his bike, and yes, he now has a key to the padlock. <laughs> Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Bill. What, a, what, a, what an amazing memory you have. Now, in deference to Jeremy's need to get off and file, I'm going to be as, 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 uh, as quick as I can without uh, candor. I want to say, first of all, what an honour it is to be giving this second speech at the BJR Charles Wheeler Award. Uh, and to salute not only Jeremy Bowen, who is one of the great TV reporters of our times, but also a Cardiff man, I think, who stands comparison for sheer televisual resourcefulness with the legendary Gitto Harry, who is there in the, yeah, of, of City Hall, who is there in the, in the second row. But also, of course, to salute the memory of Charles Wheeler, who is not only a Mount Rushmore of journalistic integrity, a brilliant and humane reporter, but also, as Bill correctly says, uh, my father-in-law. And it's thanks to people like Charles that it has for many years been a commonplace of political analysis, that journalists have grown in stature as we politicians have shrunk. Uh, but the full reality of our reduced condition was rammed home to me yet again the morning after the general election. At the invitation of the BBC, I went on telly to comment on the prospects of an exciting new LibCon coalition, and I was falteringly trying to give my opinion when my interviewer, Jeremy Paxman, broke in. Haven't you got a city to run, he said with his trademark testiness. Then why don't you go off and run it? I did manage to say something in return, but by then Zeus had turned his shining eyes away. And the overall effect was, no doubt, like a fifth form of being caught in the tuck shop and being ticked off by the most sneering and flowery waistcoated of all the prefects in the school. <laughs> we, we have just been through the most protracted humiliation of politicians at the hands of the media that this country has ever seen. In the last 18 months, many of my former parliamentary colleagues have been reduced to a kind of moral zombiedom, staggering around like the Japanese generals after Nagasaki, or like the poor blue-nosed people from Avatar, overwhelmed by the superior firepower of the press. We have been stripped of our second homes. We have forfeited trust. We have lost our dignity. We have even had our porn videos confiscated. It has been, it has been a complete rout. 
uh, the nation has responded with a most unusual event, a hung parliament. A, the cephalogical equivalent of a shrug of the shoulders because the sympathy of the public has been overwhelmingly with the media and the electorate has strongly supported the brilliant truffle hounds of the newspapers as they have dug out the malodorous truth and laid it before them. In fact, I don't think there has been a single specimen of political life who has elicited the slightest peep of compassion until, that is, David Laws came a cropper the other day. Now, Mr. Laws was, of course, just as culpable as many others, but I did, for the first time in the whole expensive scandal, notice a certain restiveness and impatience in the audience. How long was it all going to continue? How many more sacrifices to Moloch, some of my friends seem to be saying. So can I nervously seize on the moment of doubt to pose a few questions about journalists and politicians and the relative positions of the two professions in this scandal-blasted landscape? I mean, which of the two behaves better? Which earns more money? Who has more power? Who really runs Britain? And I speak as a Tiresias who has seen both sides of the debate. And insofar as the relationship between journalists and politicians is meant to be, a, uh, meant to be like that between a dog and a lamppost, then I'm a kind of Dali-style dog-come-lamppost. Uh, but the truth is, you don't need much expertise in either profession to be struck by the contrast between the ignominy of politicians and the impunity of journalists. In the old days, the assumption was that journalists had more fun, but politicians had more power, or at the very worst, more of the trappings of power. That was the symmetry. In the old days, at a happy occasion like this one, journalists were broadly expected to get drunk, make improper advances to one another, and fall asleep in the flower beds. Politicians always had less leeway to behave badly, but on the whole, at the end of the evening, they had the sense of superiority that comes with a car, a driver, and a red ministerial box winking on the back seat. Journalism was something you did for all kinds of reasons. Because you loved writing, because the thrill you got from seeing your name in the paper, because you wanted to bring new and important facts into the public domain, or because you were frankly unsuited to doing anything else. <laughs> hardly, uh, hardly anyone, not uh, Jeremy Bowen, certainly not Ch Charles Wheeler, hardly anyone went into journalism expecting to get rich. And no one joined the BBC in the hope of being paid out of public funds about four times more than the Prime Minister. And I don't just mean the Director General, who is on a total package of around £834,000, or the legions of stonkingly remunerated executives like the head of News Gathering or the head of BBC North, uh, though heaven knows what the head of BBC North does, except to ensure that his pay, like that of so many others, is north of £400,000. Uh, we, still, we still don't know. We still don't know about the. We still we still don't know about the BBC talent. We we don't know the we don't know the figures. Ma Dimbleby, Paxman himself. They went through a whole election dominated by politicians' expenses without revealing what they earn. Uh, even though I asked Paxman fourteen times in a, <laughs> in, in a Newsnight interview to tell us how much he hauls down from the taxpayer, he still refuses to cough. Not surprisingly, since the total package is thought to be in excess of a million pounds and the chicken-hearted BBC still refuses to broadcast that interview in full. In fact, if you were, if you were a particularly self-pitying sort of politician, you might start to think there is one law for this, one law for us, and one law for them. 